Welcome to the Money and Finance programme with me, Gemma Forte. We're here at the London Stock Exchange Studios in the heart of the city for a unique programme where some of the country's leading experts from the world of finance and property are invited to share unreservedly their views about the industry. So I'm looking to finding out what today brings, so let me introduce my guests straight away. First up, we have Tony Gimple. Paul Mahoney and Piragesh Sivanason. Welcome, gentlemen. Great to see you all today. Now, in today's programme, we are going to be getting the views of our panellists on subjects which include whether and how far private landlords are in the Chancellor's line of fire, the importance or perhaps not of investment portfolio diversification and property as a vehicle for wealth creation. But first, we are going right to the heart of how politics may or may not affect the tens of thousands of private landlords in the country. So we're specifically asking, will Brexit or politics generally, and should I maybe mention Jeremy Corbyn, make life harder for the UK's army of private landlords? So, Tony, I might start with you with this one. Mm -hmm. What do you think? There's a shortage of housing, an ageing population. Brexit will play out over, overall for the good. Mm. Either way, people are still going to need homes. Landlords, however, are a visible target for politicians of every colour. Mm. One, one would have thought that a Tory government wouldn't try and tax landlords out of existence, but they have with mm. Section 24. Mm. On the far left, Marxism, property is theft, and the government is in the hands of rogue landlords. So come what may, you know, politics, Brexit, taxation, mm. landlords are still going to be in the firing line. Yeah. That said, if they're running professional property businesses, they will be able to provide a real social function to occupy the vacuum for the lack of public money, both at a local and national level, in providing quality, affordable housing, mm. you know, both at either end of the market. Mm. So yes, it's going to be tough. Yeah. Yes, there'll be more attacks, you know, to fund the gaps in social care. Yeah. But overall, if landlords do the right things, build the right properties, work with the system, then they'll come through the other end like any other business should. Mm. I, I suppose that is the problem that they're trying to solve, is the fact that rents are so high now, aren't they? And with so many people not able to get on the property ladder, there is an inherent problem there and an imbalance, which I guess they're trying to address. What do you think, Paul? I, I think that's the way it was spun. Yeah. Um, uh, but in reality, I think landlords were just a soft target. Yeah. Um, you know, landlords are viewed as fat cats that, you know, steal from the, the poor, but that, that's not the truth. You know, landlords mm. provide housing to a, a market that, that vastly needs Wants housing. It, yeah. um, the government needed money to fill out their budget and, and they targeted landlords to get it. That, mm. that's, I think that seems to be the general sort of consensus view of, of uh, property industry professionals now, now that we've had time to digest okay. the, the, the changes. Um, I think the, the, the two topics actually tie into each other quite well, being Brexit and further targeting, further legislative change, in that with Brexit, the government's going to be very busy <laughs> on things that aren't landlords. You yeah, know? Yeah. So I think, I think shortly, certainly in the short term, it would be very difficult for any fo more focus to be given to, to hurting landlords, which yeah. is probably a good thing. Mm. Um, and when you say hurting landlords, though, is it not more not the professional landlords as such they're going after, but the, the individuals who in the past had some pension pot, if you like, and they've put it into property because they can and because it's, if you like, an easy way to make money and they're trying to clamp down on that a bit? Yeah, again, that's a, a way of looking at it. that They're, they're looking to professionalise yeah. landlords and, and certainly if landlords are doing things the right way, mm. um, it can mitigate the effects of, of all of these changes. Mm. There is certainly more reason now to have a, a proper strategy um, to, to deal with current legislation yep. um, as opposed to in the past it's been a very sort of DIY type activity. You know, go down, speak to your local uh, estate agent, buy a property and make loads of money. Mm. Um, that's not what it's about anymore. 
You know, you need to make sure that you're structuring things in the right way, that you have a strategy, a clear idea of your goals. As Tony said, a business plan, because yeah. that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, investing in property is, is, is a business and, and you need to go about it in the right way. Okay, so essentially things have got tougher, much yes. tougher recently, but you think that Brexit, rather than make things even harder, it's actually a distraction. It is, Brexit is a distraction all mm. the way around. You know, we're a maritime trading nation, so we'll continue to do what we've always done, you know, make money through opportunity and adversity. Yeah. But government only seeks to regulate sectors mm. which are making money and doing well, because there's no mileage in spending public funds on failing industries. Yeah. And the housing sector, the private landlord sector, works on every single level. Mm -hmm. What about you, Pirigesh? Is politics something you, uh, you, you're particularly interested in or you try to avoid? Um, I think despite whatever my political view is, mm. um, I think one of the most interesting things, I think, you know, you mentioned Jeremy Corbyn. Um, people have been talking about rent controls being a disaster. People are talking about him going after big businesses. But actually, like my colleagues have said, ultimately, if you're a business, if you're a property owner in this environment, you know, there are only two main political parties. You've got to prepare for probably a Conservative government or prepare yeah. for a Labour government. Yeah. And when we talk about rent controls and things like that, New York, New York State has had rent controls since 1942, mm. yet we're still talking about one of the most buoyant real estate markets. Um, the other thing is I back entrepreneurs. I back the landlords in this market. They will find a way. Um, we've already seen with the number of legislation, lenders as well, Will, will innovate, they'll find new ways in order to lend money in, in, a, in a legal way. Um, I think with regards to Brexit, my underlying feeling is, let's get some certainty into it. That's what's gonna help everyone. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You know, I think while we're sitting here debating, could this happen, could yeah. this happen, when's the, let's imagine you're a landlord based in student housing. Mm. As of today, students are incorporated within the immigration cap. Now. That would be a big worry for me because foreign students coming in are actually potentially a big earner and we're seeing loads of cities with great big developments really um, yeah. on the back of student housing. So yeah. um, I, I always think these, these sorts of things present opportunities um, and I think absolutely what you said about um, the accidental landlord, it will become harder and harder for them. Um, but equally, when we talk about innovation, there's crowdfunding now, there's, yeah. diff there's REITs, there's different ways for people to invest in property, still get that exposure. Mm -hmm. But today, I think, is marks a, a, an important line. I think if you're going to become um, a landlord in the future, you do have to professionalise. There is plenty of opportunity for you to take advantage of the opportunities coming. OK, so property as a vehicle for wealth then, largely sort of it doesn't touch it really. What do you think, Paul? Well, you know, it, it remains it remains the same. You know, mm. short-term legislative changes, things like Brexit, it doesn't doesn't affect uh, property as an asset class longer term. As no. we've been saying, you just need to make sure you have the right strategy in place. Mm -hmm. um, uh, obviously, there's been a lot of negative media around around the recent changes, and uh, uh, from what I've seen, the examples that are used in that are very much spun toward the articles that are written. Um, so. Property is still, in my view, the, the, the best asset class for creating and storing wealth yep. for the broadest range of people, mm -hmm. especially those that are looking to be quite passive. Mm -hmm. Well, as you say, because what, what are the options? If you don't invest in property, I guess you're looking at the stock market and, you know, that, that could be a lot riskier for a lot of people. You know, property yeah. tends to hold its value unless something goes horribly wrong, doesn't it? Well, it does. It's, really, I mean, it's quite opposite. We're in the capital of capitalism, yeah. of the London Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. And e equities are highly sentiment based. You know, the, the price we pay for fuel is precious little based on what it costs to get out the ground, mm. but on what people will think it'd be worth in the future. And that hasn't changed since Roman times. The Romans speculated on, on, on the Egyptian grain crop. Bricks and mortar, mm. somewhere for people to live, is readily understood, mm. if done properly, capital growth notwithstanding, which is actually worthless until you come to, to cash it in is great income, provides a nice resource for future generations, mm. and when done properly, is highly sustainable. Yeah, plus in terms of um, sort of Europe as a whole, I think particularly us Brits, 
we see property as something that we really aspire to. You know, I know in Italy and other countries, the culture just isn't the same. There's not such kudos in sort of owning your own property. It's not necessarily something you expect and people will rent for years and years and years. So maybe also just culturally, we're very sort of embedded towards wanting to have our own property. You know, Tony mentioned before but the stability of property, that regardless of what's happening in the economy, people need somewhere to live. Yes. yes. And, and, and in the UK, we have a massive undersupply in mm. comparison to a growing demand. Yeah. We're, bu we're building around half of the required yearly supply yeah. and have been doing for, so for, for over a decade. Mm. And whilst ever you've got a dynamic like that in the market, it's, it's impossible to argue against prices continuing to increase mm. over the mid to long term. It's obviously cyclical, but as a property investor, so long as you're, you're buying in the right areas, mm. even if the economy completely goes belly up, People still need to live you know, in, in a house, they still need a roof over their heads. So mm -hmm. you, you can have confidence in the right circumstances that your rent is sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and prices don't really matter um, when you own property. You don't have a ticker on your letterbox. You can't really tell what the price is mm -hmm. until it comes time to sell it or remortgage it. Yeah. So unless it, you need to sell at that you know, very bad point in time, it doesn't really matter, it's a paper loss. Mm. So as a long-term um, investment asset, it works really well. Yeah, and I think we all know that things have cooled off a little bit in the capital, but actually maybe on a positive note, what recent legislation has, has, has meant is that the wealth is being distributed further you know, into the rest of the UK. Well, yeah, you just have to look at things like HS2, Crossrail and so on. You know, compare yields to the North East, 14% pre-tax, mm. not very much capital growth. London. 1.8%, 2%, but lots of capital growth historically. Mm -hmm. And income is easier to turn into capital sometimes than capital itself, and it does spread the wealth around the country. Yeah, and, and, and you mentioned before you know, all the speculation around Brexit. Of course, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Nobody does. It's still, I don't think the government know exactly how it's going to play out yet. Still trying to figure it out. So, but perhaps people now, we've gone through at first, when Brexit mm. came out, everything sort of stopped, didn't it? People were waiting to find out, and now perhaps people just simply need to get on yeah. with their working lives. I think more than ever, what's really important, when people talk about wealth, it means different things to different people. Mm. Um, for some people, wealth means generating a certain cash flow going forward. Mm. For others, it is literally about having a bricks and mortar asset worth X million. And I think if people start with that, I think the next thing really is that, you know, something I'm sure my colleagues will agree is that property actually is really vast. There's loads of little niches within that. Um, there's buying your own home, a home that you live in that will generate a little bit of wealth for you. But there's also investing, there's simple investing, the buy to let that everybody, well, it seems like everybody owns or everybody's next door neighbor mm, owns. Mm. But there's also, there's development finance, there's, uh, you know, houses of multiple occupation. There's commercial property versus residential property, which is another different way of kind of investing. And, and like I reiterated, there's also funds. There's different ways of getting exposure. You know, for someone, they can start off very small in a way that makes sense, that shields, that can use kind of tax structures, etc. cetera, that's kind of yeah. really shields their wealth. So I think underlying property, I mean, I really wanted to say very early on, Let's compare that to Bitcoin, you know, what's mm. happening of recent time. I mean, it's gone up, it's gone down, but in the very short term, that provides very little stability of wealth. Yes. But it's an asset class. Mm -hmm. And property, I think we, you know, we're all passionate about it because I think there are so many different ways to kind of invest in it. Okay. Yeah. And I think far too many people do look at the property market mm. from a macro perspective, and there's not really such a thing. Mm. There's no, there's no prop, there's no UK property index as far as I know. There's probably, mm. there's probably one created for the stock exchange, but there's no real index. Um, and certainly with all these changes, there's, there's, there's by all means a, a two-speed market at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think a big shift away from high-value, low-yield properties yeah. toward lower-value, higher-yielding properties. Yes, yes. Well, thank you very much. Most interesting, but I'm afraid that's all we've got time for in this part of the programme. But don't go away, because as soon as we get back, we'll be tackling the issues of risk, leverage and investment 101. So don't go away.
Welcome back to part two of this money and finance special with me, Gemma Forte, and my guests today who are Tony Gimple, Paul Mahoney, and Pirigesh Sivanason. Okay, so tax regulation and licensing are some of the most unpopular words in the financial dictionary. So let's find out why. So, Tony, I might start with you. Do you think that landlords are going to remain in the tax firing line over the next few years? Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, increasingly. And we'll end it there. <laughs> <laughs> if only it was that easy. I increasingly so. Yeah. Uh, um, they're an easy target. Mm -hmm. People think they make excess profits for doing nothing. Mm. Well, being, being a, a landlord is hard work. Tenants and toilets yeah. is not an easy thing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, but it's visible. Mm -hmm. And the Conservative government has deliberately targeted landlords and set a huge trap. Mm. The introduction of Section 24 and so forth is, is caused a lot of landlords to incorporate their businesses. Right. In a few years, the Chancellor of the day, left or right, will mimic what George Osborne did with capital gains tax and almost certainly introduce a surcharge on corporation tax for property companies because they have to get the money back somehow. Yeah, and yeah. that could be very painful. Mm -hmm. The other problem is that for some obscure reason, being a landlord is treated as being an investment business mm. as opposed to being a trading business. And yet, working as a landlord, actively managing, be it social or high-end, is just as physical and hard work mm. as managing a corner shop or running a professional practice. Yeah. Taxation will continue to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I and mean, as you say, if you're a responsible, good landlord, the kind of landlord that we would all want, yep. then it is hard work, yep. and, and you are a kind of at the, uh, the the call, if you like, of your tenants. However, I suppose as you also say, it's always going to be a popular one, isn't it? Yep. Most people can say, well, if you've got enough money to be able to invest in having sort of extra property, which is the way many people see it, who can argue with that? It's a tricky one. Well, let's take the other end. Mm. You know, we, we, we have clients in Bristol, some of whom are, are recovered addicts, who run you know, social housing as landlords, mm. you know, literally looking after people coming out of addiction. Right. Are they investment landlords or are they working landlords? So would they have the same legislation applied yes. to them? Okay. Exactly the same as somebody yeah. who's just made a killing on the stock market, yeah. decides to invest the profits and do nothing else. Yeah, yeah. that does seem very unfair. It is totally unfair. Mm. You know, running a property portfolio, actively running a property portfolio, mm. is every much a trading business mm -hmm. as any other. Mm. kind of business. Yeah, and I suppose if you're looking at entrepreneurial spirit as well, yeah. it's almost like, you know, punishing people yep. for doing well. Yes. I think it's important to keep in mind, though, that because uh, a lot of people focus, especially at the moment, on tax, because there's been mm. all these tax changes. You're only taxed when you're making money. True. Mm. Um, there's an old saying, don't let the tax tail wag the investment dog. Um, you know, focus on making money. Yes. Structure it the right way and then aim to mitigate the tax. Yeah. Mm. Um, you're never going to pay, you, as you say, yeah, more tax than you've, you've you know, made money. Well, that's right. So, so being scared out of doing something because of the tax you might have to pay isn't very logical in my view. Yeah, agreed. Um, so obviously focus on what you know, your goals, put in place a strategy that's most suitable for you, make the investments to fit that strategy and put some tax strategies in place to sort of supplement that. But the main focus shouldn't be the tax that mm. needs to be paid. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And you are sort of, it's more individuals and the people you mentioned will suffer. And you know, it, it, there is an argument, surely, for just putting corporation tax up by 1%. <laughs> Solve a lot of problems, wouldn't it? It's, it's, it's not so much how much tax we pay, mm. it's what we get for it. Yes. If government were to hypothecate taxes, old Liberal Democrat policy, a penny on, you know, a penny on the pound in tax for education, yeah. we'd have a very different society. Yeah. Sadly, though, all governments seem incapable of wanting to you know, have a jam jar for a particular tax pot. Yeah. And they'd, they'd rather spend it you know, behind the scenes. It funds the occasional war and so on. Mm. And of course also only two parties now as well, which is, it basically is a two horse race, isn't it? Which makes life 
quite interesting as well. It's never really been like that before. Right, Pirigesh, let's come to you and talk a little bit about regulation. What are the key differences between regulated and unregulated finance? And where can unregulated finance be of benefit to those seeking finance for property? So um, for those guys at home, you know, this is a bit where they probably start yawning uh, they go, uh, what? A, a lot. <laughs> but, but really for the consumer, the difference between unregulated and regulated is all about protection. Mm. Because um, an individual that perhaps doesn't do any finance or is not particularly educated in, in, in all the elements of finance, when they're going and buying their first home, we're talking, especially in the UK now, hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of debt that they might be taking on. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that they're protected, that the advice that they get when they take on that, both from the lender and or a broker that supports them, is right and fit. Yeah. Um, it's also something that should be easy to explain. Mm -hmm. So there is a whole industry around this. Your high street banks typically are regulated and, well, are regulated, not typically are regulated, and also the broker that supports that. Mm. Now, the unregulated space, initially you could be thinking, okay, that sounds like the Wild West, um, and it isn't, but the main difference is that there is the assumption that someone who invests for business someone who invests actually um, does have a little bit of knowledge. So what that does, is it provides a little bit of space and a gap for the lender to assume a certain level of understanding mm -hmm. and therefore can concentrate in perhaps in being a little bit more innovative in the actual financial product. Okay. So when you say, how can an unregulated product help me? Well, if I was going to invest in a business, and that business depended on a set of projections that I decided would be likely based on a business plan. Now, to some degree, the lender can look at it, it has to be comfortable, but it doesn't need to kind of walk you through your own business plan, whereas mm -hmm. if it was regulated, it would. Yeah. Um, an interesting area very recently where the, the two are sort of um, overlapped is consumer buy to let. Okay. So this is where you have your accidental landlord who suddenly finds himself renting out a property, maybe gets quite leveraged. What I mean by leverage is that they get maybe 85% loan to value on their debt. Are they thinking about the way interest rates will affect um, the, their ability to make their interest payments? You know, None of that is linked to um, someone being employed by their employer and being able to pay off their mortgage. It's, mm -hmm. it's slightly different. Yeah. And so that's where the government, the FCA, came and said, actually, we feel we need to protect these accidental landlords mm -hmm. and provide a little bit more regulation. Now, the things, the, the types of financial products you can do, you can get in the unregulated space is simply much wider. But it, there is an assumption that the people who take on those products understand them. Okay. So, limited companies saying, if you're, if you're just incorporating your buy-to-let yeah. portfolio and now become a limited company, potentially, you're borrowing money in the unregulated space and losing the kind of consumer protection you would as the accidental individual landlord, even with a similar sized portfolio. Absolutely. So in that case, it's a really good example where you could say nothing's really changed. Yeah. Should they continue to be protected? Um, should, they, uh, should they really have access to the type of products that mm. an unregulated space does, etc.? I mean, Regulation is, is, is a very difficult thing and there's always mm. got to be a boundary somewhere. Yeah. Um, certainly what Tony describes is where the line probably yeah. is drawn. Okay. okay. In saying that though, that, the, that, that level of regulation does apply in the same way to somebody who's investing as an individual, mm. yes. intentionally, yes. as opposed to accidentally. Yes. Um, something I think is quite interesting at the moment with, with all these changes with regards to how lenders need to look at serviceability of mortgages and things, which is the regulated space, but does apply to the unregulated space as well, through which depending on which lender you are, um, is that it does seem like there may be a new sort of wave, and perhaps you better comment on this, but a new wave of buy-to-let lenders who, right. who will be unregulated and a lot more flexible okay. um, to counteract a lot of the change that happened in the moment, because there is definitely yeah. an opportunity there. Yes. It's interesting because whatever happens within the industry, everybody is pragmatic and everybody changes with it. So here's a question. Does being licensed as a landlord detract from your bottom line? 
if you read some of the comments, you'd think the answer would be yes. Right. And where there's uh, rampant disregard for what licensing means, mm. it, it, it well could. Okay. However, yeah. well regulated, well run, sustainable properties, licensed, yeah. will add value across the board. Okay. Because there, there, there is a definite market out there yeah. for people who want to rent high quality, safe, secure, you know, good place to raise the kids and live, mm -hmm. housing. And only licensing can achieve that. Okay. It all comes down to the enforcement. Like yeah. any form of regulation and compliance, yes. you know, outcome based, yeah. it depends how well it's being enforced. Mm -hmm. What we have seen is poor landlords are running away from licensing good quality landlords are making the investment now, mm -hmm. higher rents, longer term tenants, greater capital values. Mm -hmm. So once it comes in across the board mm -hmm. to an agreed standard, you know, it's done because it should be, not just because it can, yeah. then licensing will start to add to the bottom line, but not overnight. Okay, I think sort of what's becoming more and more clear is that professional advice is the yeah. key to investing at the moment, more than ever. It's not something you can navigate so easily as an individual if it's not your professional career, definitely. And I agree with what Tony said there. It, it is about the actual implementation yeah. Mm. of why you need a license, yeah. not just for, for local councils to collect a few hundred quid from you. Right. Um, because it, it does, uh, with the licensing the way it is at the moment, and it's very sort of hodgepodge all over the place, mm -hmm. it does seem in some cases it's literally mm -hmm. just about collecting yeah. a few hundred quid from landlords. Yeah. Um, whereas if, if it's put in place to make sure the landlords are actually doing the right thing and they're, they're offering safe places to live for the tenants and that sort of thing, that's obviously yeah. where it adds value. Okay, excellent. Well, we're going to have to leave that part there, um, but we will be coming back after another quick pause. And uh, in that part, we should be looking at how important portfolio balance and diversification is for landlords. So we'll see you after the break. Welcome back to this Money and Finance special with me, Gemma Forte, and my guests today, who are Tony Gimple, Paul Mahoney, and Piragesh Sivanason. Right, gentlemen, on to the final part of the show, and um, we want to talk a little bit about portfolio balance and diversification. So, will having a balanced and diversified portfolio help landlords weather any potential storm? And if so, what would that look like? Piragesh, let's start with you. I think um, before getting into the question in particular depth, I think it's mm. worth kind of looking at recent kind of corporate failures. We've had in recent times Monarch, the airline, we've had Maplin, we've had Toys R Us. Yes. These are huge organisations mm. which have, for whatever reason, taken their eye off the ball and unfortunately resulted in bankruptcies, et cetera. Yeah. Now, you can apply that same thing to your property portfolio. Um, Monarch, when it, for example, couldn't manage uh, the price of oil, uh, again, for landlords, what is that? That's interest rates. Okay. You know, how yeah. does a landlord really think about the way in which the impact of rates will impact their business going forward? Mm -hmm. um, equally, you know, uh, Monarch had a situation where terrorism, something that you just wouldn't ordinarily think mm. here. Well, you wouldn't have done so many years ago, well, exactly. necessarily, yeah. But certainly impact some of the most profitable routes. Now, mm. that's scenario planning. That's, that's thinking, what if uh, an extreme leftist government came in? So it's like uh, risk strategy. It's a risk yeah. strategy, and it's really starting to. So once you start to interplay all of those, then you can start to see, is my property portfolio mm. balanced? Mm -hmm. Because once you run it through those scenarios, if, for example, you've got all your property in central London and they're all buy-to-lets, for example, what does that now look like if there's an issue in central London or if licensing happens in London in a way that you don't expect? Yeah, right, okay. What yeah. if, so now you can start thinking geographically. Mm -hmm. Equally, there are different elements to, um, to property like we've discussed throughout the show, commercial, residential, development, how do each of these play out? 
HMOs, so this is a house of multiple occupation. So this is where you have a number of individuals in a house, your yep. yield is a lot higher, but of course that business has its own mm. risks. Um, institutional money coming in and creating these incredible units with cinemas and all, how, how do you compete as a landlord? Mm. So absolutely, balance is all about, but how do you know day one if I have balance? Well, I'll test it. I'll yeah. scenario test it for all the different things that we've talked about and the stuff we we haven't thought about. Yes. That's the way well, we see. Yeah, because I really it. like that analogy and it's a very interesting way of looking at it. But then, okay, so with Toys R Us, you mentioned, perhaps with them, it was just a case of the whole world changing around them, the market changing, people playing on video games more, not playing with toys as much, possibly, has been one reason cited in that. So maybe with property, there are things you can't possibly uh, predict as well. I think the key is, is exactly that, strategy yeah. and reviewing that strategy. Mm. Um, it's not the type of thing you can just do now and be confident in making money from for the next mm. 20, 30 years. Mm. Um, remembering that the, the demand for your property comes from the target market and what that target market wants changes. Yes. It's the same as the Toys R Us story, you know, they became okay, irrelevant because yeah. they didn't change with the market. Change with the market, yeah. And of course, you know, in any business strategy you need to do that. So mm. you need to make sure that your portfolio, if we're talking property, is changing in line with where the demand is skewed. Yeah, so maybe it's just the, the, the market is going to start separating the wheat from the chaff, if you like. As you say, maybe 20 years ago, it would be harder not to make money. If you had an nest egg and put it into property, prices were just spiralling so much, it would have been difficult not to go, oh, I'm a property investor and I've done so well, and that's changed now. Well, that's also being driven mm. by not just the tax changes, but the changes in the uh, by the by the PRA, Parental Re Re Pr Prudential Regulation Authority. Yeah, easy it, for us to say. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Or not, as the case <laughs> may be, when it comes to buy to let mortgages, because mm. they have now got to look across a whole range: balance, tax, business plans, how you're dealing with voids, how you're going to deal with dilapidations, changes in the market, politics right across the board so mm. you know if you're selling a finance product lending to buy to let landlords how are they going to cope across mm. all of these measures it's no longer just about rate and term mm. it's about the business as a whole and if mm. toys r us bankers would have looked at them to the same degree as you know any good mortgage lender would now look at you know portfolio buy to let landlord they may not have lent the money or will advise them. You want the money, you're going to have to look at the market in a different way mm. and have much more balance and diversification. Yeah. And it's a very relevant point with all the changes we've been discussing because there are a lot of strategies or, or, or more specifically portfolios mm -hmm. that, that worked up until now. Yeah. And over the next four years as these changes are implemented, we'll start to work less and less. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of landlords will find themselves into, in a position of actually making a loss whereas previously they might have been making a slight gain. Mm. So that's a good example of how things change and how, how you need to change your strategy in line with that. Yeah. Um, and I suppose uh, approach things in, in more of a strategic way. Yes. The best way to do that is to get professional advice. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, yeah. And you, so you think there'll be a lot of people caught on the hop, a lot yeah. of private landlords. It's Absolutely. just going to suddenly come in and, and it really affect them without them even knowing. Well, using the, the examples mentioned before, central London um, you know, leveraged property where yields yes. are very low, um, not only will these tax changes affect those properties that might have been slightly cash flow positive previously and now they'll probably end up negative, but also the, yeah. the mortgage changes we've just been discussing. When, when they come time to remortgage, that may, that may not even be to get money out, it might just be because mm -hmm. their terms are running out. Mm -hmm. They won't be able to borrow as much, anywhere near as much as they could previously. Yeah. So th th there's, there's multiple challenges for that type of property at the moment, mm -hmm. um, and, and that is causing quite a shift away from that type of property. Mm. I think, also, I think also the interesting thing about central London we were talking about is sometimes you can, you can have your own strategy about what it is you're trying to do. Um, it may not work, and you might think, okay, but I'll just hold on for a bit because the market will change because you think mm. everybody's like you. Mm. I was at a seminar in Europe last week, and the view was... Um, there is 307, someone did a study, there's 370 billion pounds worth of money ready to come invest in the UK in property. Mm. And that 
you can't understand their mindset. No. You know, you have to figure it out for yourself. And if something doesn't work, be prepared to change. Yeah. And it might be because you're going to suddenly go out to the Midlands and invest or, or in the north of England or completely change your strategy. What you can't necessarily do is, is stick there and hope that the rest of the market is exactly like you. Right. OK. Gosh, it is very interesting indeed. Right. What are the investment options then, would you say, in terms of sort of property? What are other investment options? If you simplify it. Yes. Um, you have, we've spoken about property, mm -hmm. you have equities and cash bearing investments. Yes. That's really the only three things that you can invest in that are, in my view, actual investments. You can invest mm -hmm. in things like gold and mm -hmm. foreign exchange and cryptocurrency, but they, they are solely capital based. They don't mm -hmm. generate an income mm -hmm. and therefore they're not really investments, they're, specula they're speculations. Um, that, so the three options really simply is cash bearing investments, which is all income equities, which is income and growth, property, which is income and growth. Okay. So, you know, you can be very simple about that. Um, in my view, the reason property is, is better mm. for, the broad, for a broader range of people when it comes to creating and storing wealth is the ability for leverage. Yeah. Because from a returns perspective, when you compare property with equities, obviously, if you look at, at, at cash bearing investments or interest bearing investments, the return, you know, is always going to be less than the other two. Yeah. Because it's, it only provides you with one form of income. Mm -hmm. If you compare property with equities, overall, as a cash purchase, the returns are pretty similar mm -hmm. across the board on a high level. Property tends to be more stable, so that's one benefit that it offers. Mm -hmm. But when you add the leverage in, that's what separates property. Right. The ability to borrow over the long term on low interest rates relatively high loan to value ratios mm. and no ability for lenders to recall the mortgage unless you do something wrong mm -hmm. or you get to the end of the, the term. So you take a deposit, you leverage it four times, you know, okay. 75% mortgage yeah. um, and receive all of your returns on the overall asset value. So with regard to leverage, what are the risks of over or under leveraging? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I suppose if we're talking about property, yeah. the, the, the only risk of leveraging is that you can't service the mortgage. Okay. So you can leverage as much as you like, so long as you can continue to service that mortgage, there's no risk. But the risk is that perhaps you can't. Okay. Maybe your property's empty. Of course, the capital value could fall, but remembering, unless you sell, that's never crystallised. Well, unless, unless that is, unless you're, you're on unregulated terms and, and the deal you've agreed with your lender says you mustn't fall below a given loan to value. But that, yeah, generally that doesn't apply to residential buy to let no. mortgages, no. I suppose. Not, yeah. Yeah. So in terms of diversity and balance, sort of you as individuals even, would you think it'd be better to have uh, uh, you know, some property here and not put everything into one pie? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Unless it's a very short term pie yeah. where you understand what you're doing, yeah. you're in, you're out, you can predict the profit, you can predict the costs. Mm. If you're looking for the longer term, mm. a balanced portfolio in a balanced geography, yeah. following the trends. Because a lot of people always stick with what they know, don't yep. they? So they invest in their area where they yep. grew up and uh, because they understand it. Um, but even within that, you still need a balance between single ASTs to HMOs mm. or commercial you know, or, or balance of them all. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you can, however, uh, access your capital uh, um, recycle it and have, like any other business would, you know, a portfolio based on geography, demand and type. So mm -hmm. you know, if one part of the portfolio tanks, mm -hmm. the others will easily make up the slack. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go out of business tomorrow. Okay. I think, uh, you know, attached to that, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people at home going, oh, balanced, boring, <laughs> balanced, you know. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, if you want sky high returns, the problem is, is it's prob the probability of it actually coming off is low. The way in which you create true wealth, mm. I would say, is over the medium and long term. So right. what you really need is something stable that is constantly able to compound. Now, how you actually piece that pie up is yeah. very much dependent on your own mm. personal circumstances. Mm -hmm. But it's boring, but that is the way true wealth is created. Slow and steady wins the race. I think so. <laughs> but it's, but it's well, not static the, either. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. On that same point, it, it's very important to understand what types of... We spoke about diversification in property and there is... You can diversify vastly across different types of returns and different values to geographical areas, etc. 
but it's important to understand what types of returns are most suitable for you mm. and your stage of life, you know, where you're at. Yes. Um, because, you know, somebody that's very wealthy and mm. is just looking to store their wealth and generate income has a very different criteria to somebody who's looking to create wealth. Yes, absolutely. And I guess when all is said and done, it is all about those things, but it's also always a little bit of luck sometimes yeah. because perhaps somebody that invested in in Manchester how many years ago and now things are moving away from London a little bit and suddenly that investment is even better. One of our most successful clients was well in excess of 300 properties and rich beyond the dreams of avarice one day turned left out of the station as opposed to turn right. Mm. He saw a property and thought that can't be as cheap as that and it was and he bought it and 30 years later completely and utterly independently wealthy. So that's how he began? Yeah, purely chance. Yeah. Nothing more. And Although, it, so yes, absolutely, and yet he was he was opportunistic enough to, to, to go for it and dynamic enough to take the risk. And, correct. Yeah, but yes, exactly. Well, I think it's been absolutely fascinating and thank you so much to all of you for joining us here on this Money and Finance special. And sadly, that is all we've got time for today. But please join us next time when industry experts will be sharing their views, tackling other topics within the world of money and finance. So thank you so much to Tony Gimple, Paul Mahoney and Pirigesh Sivanason. That's all from me, Gemma Forte. I'll see you next time. Finance and Money Programme is proudly brought to you by Landlord Smart.